Coming up ahead in this episode of X Talk Spotlight. I think as we are asking more and more of sites, when trials might recruit maybe less patients overall because that specificity increases, and sites will have to take on more studies to recruit the amount of patients to kind of achieve their business goals, right? And to remain sustainable as a business. It's going to be really important that we empower them to think flexibly about their own models. Hello, and welcome to X Talk Spotlight, illuminating insights from subject matter experts and industry thought leaders. I'm Sonia Hunt. In this episode, we're asking the question, how can sites be empowered for optimum trial performance beyond the protocol? In today's complex clinical trial landscape, site success hinges on more than just protocol adherence. From patient recruitment and retention to managing site burden and vendor complexity, practical strategies are necessary in order to resonate with real-world site challenges. In this Xtalk Spotlight edition, I sat down with Dr. Rebecca Sayers, Senior Director, Global Head Site Enablement Solutions at IQVIA. We discussed how strategic cooperation tailored communication, and risk-based site management can unlock peak performance. You'll learn how clinical trial educators, monitors, and communication plans can transform the site experience, and why performance-based engagement is the future of trial delivery. Thank you for taking the time in the Spotlight interview, Rebecca. It is my pleasure to be here and to really expand on some of the topics from our previous site strategy webinar. So to start us off, what are the most common barriers sites face today in patient recruitment and retention? And how can sponsors better support them? I think this is an area that we have to manage quite a bit, and it's certainly changing as the landscape changes. But I think what sites are up against, in short, are just the the sheer complexity of eligibility criteria, especially when we're talking about recruiting patients. The, you know, indications where there's so many requirements about con meds or previous exposure to different classes of medications, specific events the subject has, has had to experience to be eligible, lab values that might not be standard of care or something that patients have access to or be in the site's records. It just makes it quite complicated and time consuming to identify those patients. So as that complexity increases, and we and we see that um, in the data that, that's coming through from places like a Cuvia Institute and others, that it's that that burden on the site to find the patients is quite a bit. And then on top of that, more and more sponsors are looking for those patients, right? We're talking about indications that are very competitive. There's a high patient recruitment burden on them. So again, there it's more time to find the patients. There's less patients available per study. So it makes it quite intense. And so I think that all comes to that time demand that's on the site. And so the more that we can make things simple and straightforward, it's going to make it a lot easier on the sites. And that's certainly something that our sponsors can help do when they're thinking about not just the protocol design, but the conduct of that trial, what vendors they're going to use, the simplicity of those vendors, how much efficiency can sites get, you know, if it's something that they're used to using or something that's got um, less burden for them to take part of. Any time that we save for the sites is time that they can put back into patient recruitment and accelerating those those programs. The the retention piece is similar too as we're looking at studies that are getting longer and longer and safety follow ups or outcomes endpoints that time to follow up with the patient, make sure they're in conduct with the sites as these trials get larger and larger. Um, keeping that patient on gets more and more important that, again, that time investment and that retention is is really critical. And so I think, again, the right tools and the right focus on simplicity for the site is something that we really want to make sure that our sponsors are thinking about when they're outlining their kind of overall site engagement strategy and how that's going to contribute to that trial success. Now, how does a risk-based approach to site communication improve trial efficiency and site satisfaction? I want to go back to what I said about time, right? Time is a non-renewable resource 
for the site. So anything that we're doing that's clogging the site's time, and we just talked about, you know, the the burden on eligibility criteria, looking for patients, the overall simplicity of the the trial design and the conduct expectations, the communication that we're putting on sites is also part of that too. When we just have, a, I don't want to call it a strategy because I don't think it's very strategic, but when we're just blasting the sites with email messages, phone calls, have you, you know, have you done these queries, right? The sites are getting inundated with these kinds of messages and it gets impossible for them to prioritize. And a lot of times these messages don't have value. It's probably incredibly difficult for them to prioritize across multiple studies that they're working on. So the easier we make that for them is going to be really important. And a major way we can do that is by tailoring that message and being really mindful about when we're contacting them and using a risk-based approach is a a key way to do that. And by that, I mean, on the sponsor side, on the CRO side, really understanding the, the spectrum of site performance that you have on your study and knowing that maybe site, whatever we're talking about, whether it's patient recruitment or data entry, the sites that are doing the best don't need a message that's that's scolding all of the sites about, oh, get your data in, right? So because when they see that message and they see, oh, that's not applicable for me, they're not going to read it. And so then maybe the next time you send them something that is important, maybe they won't read that either, right? So really making sure that what we tell sites is important to them at that time is really critical and can be really powerful and having that overall, again, that strategy, that site strategy align with the overall study goals. Um, I think what we really want to see sponsors do and what I've seen work really well is when there's a really comprehensive plan that's set out at the beginning of the trial, almost like a marketing team would do a marketing plan, right? You know ahead of time what you want to cover in the course of the study, what your risks are, and making sure that the messaging that we send to sites is insightful. It gives them something of value that's really relevant to that study. And it has to be adaptable too, because we're not sure what might change? Let's say in the middle of recruitment, a new compound gets approved, right? And it drastically changes the patient recruitment potential for that trial. You have to be swift and agile and really change that messaging and have something that sites are going to respond to and understand kind of what the impact is that of that is going to be and then what your expectations are of them. And could you explain what role clinical trial educators and monitors play in delivering a concierge experience to sites? The site relationship is incredibly important. That individual site relationship on that trial is, I think, going to always be an indicator of success. And CRAs, um, Clinical Research Associates, I think that's obviously an industry standard. Everyone knows what a CRA does and what their, their role is. They are critical in making sure those sites are trained properly, that they can conduct the protocol the way that the sponsor has intended with the the tools that have been provided, whether that's tech tools or the the central laboratory, right? All of those things are intertwined and have to be done in a very specific way to be able to be successful on the study. So there's there's a lot, right? And again, I'll go back to simplicity. The more complex we make it overall, we then transfer that complexity to the CRA that has to get the site kind of up and running on that. And 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 that's a challenge too. So I think when we're able to really keep that in mind, what those expectations are, that results in a better experience in that um, kind of traditional CRA site relationship that that we all know. But if we go back to before, as this as trial complexity is increasing, as the assessments are getting more complicated monitors' jobs are getting harder. So when we think about, you know, some of the hand-holding and more personalized experience, just like everything in this world, the time for that personal touch is getting less and less. It's just kind of a factor of, of our reality. And so the clinical trial educator role or similar roles that are available in the industry, whether it's a sponsor's kind of site relationship lead or whoever that might be, the the role in really having that white glove experience with the site, because we're recognizing that what we're asking of sites is 
pretty high burden, but there are multiple systems that they have to manage. If they have a problem, they have multiple help desks that they might have to go to. And the, what seems like a simple ask, hey, screen a patient on this study, can be really challenging if there's not someone there to kind of help guide you, help explain why the why this has been set up this way, why it's important for the overall scientific integrity of the trial. All of those things are really important. And that's where a role like a clinical trial educator is really valuable. Um, I was at a SCRS uh, summit last year and the feedback from some of our sites who had worked with IQV as clinical trial educators previously was really great because sites are, they, they need to know why, right? They need to know why something is important, um, get that sort of extra training on something. And we see that come forward in less protocol deviations, higher engagement with the study, um, really understanding too, in the event that a protocol amendment comes through, what does that mean, right? And so really having someone that can call you up or come on site and say, hey, here's the changes, here's what you need to know, here's how this is going to change how you recruit patients or this visit or this assessment and be really clear about that. And then we, we see that translate into success for the site. And now to wrap up, how can sites be empowered to diversify their clinical roles and technology capabilities to advance their performance? I think this is an area that is something that, you know, all of us are kind of thinking about, right? Like our our world collectively does not stay the same, right? Things are dynamic. We evolve different ways of doing things. And I think from what I've seen, the sites that have really kind of leaned into a different way of doing things themselves and asking, hey, now that we have this new technology or this is the trend for this type of protocol or this indication, I'm going to change what I'm doing. I'm going to look at my business model and I'm going to kind of ask like, well, if I specialize a role here and have more of these tasks done by this type of person and then have these types of tasks done by this type of person, I can be more efficient as a site. And so I think as we are asking more and more of sites, when trials might recruit maybe less patients overall because that specificity increases and sites will have to take on more studies to recruit the amount of patients to kind of achieve their business goals, right, and to remain sustainable as a business, it's going to be really important that we empower them to think flexibly about their own models. And within IQVIA, we have a lot of different ways that we're able to support sites and support sponsors in doing that. And I think when we're, again, stepping back and going back to the kind of the strategic webinar that we did a few weeks ago, and assessing that overall strategy, really thinking about what we can give to sites in terms of resources to help them modify those strategies is something that will overall be helpful. And whether that's uh, trying to take burden off sites by offering, designing a protocol that offers more home visits. So instead of asking patients to come to the sites, we're kind of building in this model where a nurse just comes to the home and they conduct the visits and then the site doesn't have to do that visit anymore. If the site's not tying up their nurse or study coordinator on um, those kinds of visits, they might be able to take on another study, right? And then have more patient recruitment for, for another area that they don't have a study for. So I think we, we really want our sponsors to understand that dynamic and help us and partner with us on thinking creatively about how to get different roles and models to sites to help make sites more efficient overall, because I think that's going to benefit the industry overall and really get medicines to patients faster if we start thinking differently. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca, for speaking with us today. We really appreciate your time and insights. You're welcome. This was really a pleasure to be here, and I always enjoy a chance to talk about supporting sites. We look forward to learning more about IQVIA's work to address real-world site challenges. Thank you all for joining us for this X Talk Spotlight feature. We hope you enjoyed the discussion.